So rule interpretation is a huge part of Formula One and when I do these stories they're usually my favourite stories to do. Seeing rules get bent and seeing things go into these really cool grey areas to gain any little bit of advantage these teams can find. The sort of stuff that would cause absolute carnage on social media if it existed back then. I mean, take for instance the Brabham fan car. It was deemed legal thanks to a rule that said over 50% of its intended use was for the thing that it was claimed for. Brabham said that massive fan on the back was to cool the engine, and that a side effect of it was the increase in downforce. The FIA ran some tests and found that to indeed be the case. The fan did more to cool the engine than it gave in downforce and was deemed legal. But then it was voluntarily withdrawn because it was too good and Bernie needed the privateer teams on his side. More recently, there was stuff like DAS. Before that, there was the F-duct. Before that, there was the double diffuser, and so on and so on and so on. But in this modern F1 world, it's all dependent on who you support that determines whether an innovation or a rule bend is legal or not. Double diffusers? Get your own and stop crying. DAS? Yeah. F*** Mercedes. And in 1999, a clever interpretation of these rules kept Ferrari within a shot of taking the World Championship, thanks to them discovering that the FIA did something differently to how all the other teams figured the FIA was doing things. And this is how Ferrari managed to dodge disqualification at the 1999 Malaysian Grand Prix. And it was an exciting time going into that race. Not only was Formula 1 at a brand new venue in terms of a scratch-built venue for the first time since 1996, you know, the... A1 ring being a redesign rather than being all new, it was also the first race back for Michael Schumacher who had broken his leg at that year's British Grand Prix. Now, how Ferrari got him back in the car is a funny story in itself. The story goes that Luca de Montezemolo called up Schumacher's house to see how the then two-time champion was doing, and his wife or daughter or somebody else at the house picked up the phone. Is Michael there? Um, yeah, he's out back playing football, I'll just go and get him. Now there is a theory here that Schumacher never wanted to return to the 1999 season because he either A, wasn't going to win the championship now so what was the point in turning up, or B, helping Eddie Irvine potentially win the championship in a Ferrari before he could would destroy his ego. Or this C, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. This part of the story concludes with Luca basically saying, we're paying you massive amounts of money to race, you're racing, pack your bags and get over here for some testing. Now the Malaysian Grand Prix was to be held at the brand new Sepang circuit near Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia, a purpose-built Herman Tilke design racetrack that was about 3.5 miles long and at the time was the most advanced facility in Formula 1, if not the world. Schumacher blitzed his way to pole, about a second ahead of Irvine while the McLaren struggled, Coulthard in front of Hakkinen by just over half a tenth of a second. And I've put the full qualifying classification on your screen to show how spread the field was in those days. The arrows of Takagi being almost 5 seconds off the pace of Schumacher, with the rest of the field being spread over about 3.8 if you remove Badoa's Minardi as well. And that's a huge gap. In there as well, you had Damon Hill in ninth, who had been struggling all season and was ready to quit, having lost the love for Formula 1 following the 1996 championship win, because, in his own words, he'd done what he had to do. And there was the two Stuarts of Herbert and Barrichello qualifying very well after the previous round's performance at the Nürburgring, where Herbert won with Barrichello third. It's a race I've covered before and may need to look at again, given the chaoticness. And at the start, Schumacher went into the lead before allowing Irvine to pass him on lap four and then be a rear gunner to keep Coulthard and Hakkinen in behind. On the very next lap, though, Coulthard managed to force his way past the German and then chase down Irvine's car but the typical McLaren reliability kicked in and the fuel pressure went, meaning it was now down to Hakkinen to somehow beat the two Ferraris. Schumacher continued to hold Hakkinen up, which then forced McLaren into a panic with their pit stops. Just before McLaren pitted, Schumacher sped up, and McLaren pitted Hakkinen, giving him half a tank of fuel, hoping that would get him out in front of the Ferrari. It didn't work. When Schumacher pitted, he was out in front of Hakkinen and continued to block him for the entirety of the next stint, which allowed Irvine to build a lead of about 20 seconds. The gap wasn't big enough for Irvine to pit and he got out in front, but because McLaren pitted earlier, Hakkinen would have to stop again. So when it all cycled round, Schumacher led from Irvine with Hakkinen now in fourth behind Herbert. With a few laps left, Schumacher slowed down enough for Irvine to retake the lead, and just after Schumacher took the lead, Hakkinen managed to muscle his way past Herbert. Irvine won the race from Schumacher, with Hakkinen in third place and taking the final podium spot, which meant that the championship would go down to the wire at the next race in Japan in about two weeks from this point. However, 
After the race, the stewards disqualified both Ferraris for an irregularity regarding their barge boards. The aerodynamic devices used to slow down air entering the side pods and also reduce the aerodynamic drag of those side pods. The stewards have found when measured the barge boards were a centimetre too short at the base plate than what was allowed in the regulations. And with the rule being very black and white, Ferrari was disqualified from the race and Hakkinen was champion. The disqualification news came during a celebratory Ferrari dinner that evening. And I remember finding out about this all via the awesome invention that was the BBC CFAX service, better known as Teletext. I think Dad had put it on to get the football scores or something and it popped up with Ferrari disqualified from the Malaysian Grand Prix, or a headline to that effect. The term breaking news hadn't been invented back then, which was great for nine-year-old me because Hacken and Coulthard and those black and silver McLarens were cool. I liked McLaren, Jordan and Williams back then. McLaren because of Hakkinen and Coulthard, Jordan because of Damon Hill, and Williams because well, of Damon Hill. And back to the race, Patrick Head was told by Ross Braun, hey, there's nothing we can do, we've just got to, you know, cope. The rule is the rule, we can't do anything about it. And then they went and appealed. And yes, it was a quite anticlimactic way to end the season. It had effectively been won in the steward's office instead of being out on track. But the thinking was, if the car is illegal, the car is illegal. It's like the women's relay at the Commonwealth Games, which England had won. The medal was then taken away because Jodie Williams had put her foot out of her lane. If she's out of her lane, she's out of her lane. It's a rule as old as the event. Ferrari, on the other hand, believed they might have a case, and took the disqualification to the FIA's Court of Appeal, where they disputed the disqualification. Bernie Eccleston was, meanwhile, in the news saying the rule was too strict, and the whole thing was bad for the sport, and words to that effect. There was also a rumour going around that someone at McLaren had tipped off the FIA to the barge board being illegal, but I failed to see how they would have known that without measuring it themselves, or if someone at McLaren at the time had eyes with built-in tape measures. Ferrari was initially cleared, but the FIA wanted a second look at the barge boards, and when they took that second look at the barge boards, they realised they'd been measuring it in the wrong place. The FIA was measuring the barge board at a specific point the rest of the season, but on this particular day at the Malaysian Grand Prix, they'd measured it from the base, where they found that it was too short by just one centimetre. If they measured it in the place they'd been measuring it all season, the barge board was kosher, but when they measured it where it should have been done, well, it wasn't legal. Ferrari had just been very clever at exploiting a gap in the rulebook, which then caused some confusion and opinions came from all directions. Ferrari changed the design for the Japanese Grand Prix, prompting David Coulthard to say that if it needed to be changed, it must be illegal. Jackie Stewart said that the measuring system had been the same all year and that one team shouldn't be granted an exception for just one race. But, as always, it's just protecting interests. Coulthard wanted 10 points for Hakkinen to take the championship. Stewart would have got another double podium if the disqualification had been upheld. But in the end, it didn't matter really. Hakkinen would win the following race in Suzuka and become a double world champion. Ferrari would take the constructors, but 12 months later they'd get what they wanted, a driver's championship, and they'd go on to have an unprecedented domination run that was only recently beaten. So then a look at the controversial barge boards from the 1999 Malaysian Grand Prix. If this has refreshed your memory or if you've learned something new here today, do give the video a like. And if you want to see more from this channel, get subscribed and also get that bell on so you never miss out on anything I do here. Massive thanks to the kind folk at Patreon for the continued support, and if you want to help contribute to the purchasing of images for these videos, links to Patreon will be down in the description. Or there is the super thanks if you want to buy me a pint without being tied to a monthly, you know, stuff. Oh, and there's also links to Discord and my socials down there as well. So until next time, I've been Aidan Mill, have a cracking day wherever you live in the world, and I'll see you all again soon for another video. Goodbye.